you said the United States has strong institutions, but a weak society. And Israel has a very strong society, but weak institutions. American society is broken. Deaths of despair from drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and suicide at record levels. Israel, on every one of these metrics, is not just doing a little better, it's in an opposite direction. Israelis are living longer than Europeans, Americans. There's no loneliness crisis. There's no teen mental health crisis. Uh, there's a sense of happiness and optimism. Even during low points, Israel ranks the fourth happiest country in the world. Dan, where does this podcast find you? New York City. Nice. So we actually have a history. We, You and my sister were roommates, what, 25, 30 years ago, right out of college in D.C.? You know, I, I, I appreciate the reference. I don't appreciate the, because the, implying the that is the, is the age. You know, it's like whenever I, on my podcast, when I have folks on, I always, when they're old friends, I always say longtime friends rather than old friends because people are very sensitive to anything that involves multiple decades. And here we are. Yes, it was the mid-1990s. So it was 1995. I was a young congressional aide. So, yeah, that was, wow, close to thir three decades. Wow, that's wild. And you, so let's bust right into it. You wrote this book, The Genius of Israel, The Surprising Resilience of a Divided Nation in a Turbulent World. And quite frankly, the frame changed dramatically with the events of October the 7th. Give us a sense, you've kind of become this unofficial spokesperson for uh, what it feels like to be Jewish in the U.S. right now. Talk to us about, as um, an observant Jew, your observations around, and I'm not an observant Jew, um, what I would describe as a surprising amount of anti-Semitism. I, I, the way I describe it is, you know, they say two-thirds of an iceberg's mass are below the surface. In this instance, it feels like 99% of anti-Semitism was below the surface. I, I'm just shocked. I didn't know it was there. So I will tell you, um, I've been living and breathing Jewish life my entire life. Uh, I'm a moderately, I guess, observant Jew, depending on different what, what stage of life uh, I've been in. Uh, but I've been deeply immersed in Jewish communal life my entire entire life, and I have been very involved with the state of Israel and with U.S.-Israel relations, certainly most of my life, my adult life. I, I'm the son of a Holocaust survivor. So my mother, who's 85 years old, who lives in Jerusalem today, uh, is a, is a, her father was killed in Auschwitz. She and her mother barely escaped the train to Auschwitz. Uh, she and her siblings were on the run. She was hidden out by uh, what we call righteous Gentiles who risked their lives to to save her life as a little girl. Uh, parts of her family beyond just her father were wiped out. Um, my wife and I took her and her, you know, 15 members of our family back to her hometown. Coincidentally and eerily, just this past summer, we went to the home where she was chased out of by the Nazis. We had three generations of the family traveling with us. Her generation, my generation, and all of our my siblings and, and my kids. We, it was a roots trip, and we went to Auschwitz, too, where her father was killed. So I, I, I tell you all this as background, that the stories of the Holocaust, the stories of anti-Semitism was sort of like in the water. It, when I was growing up, it was, in, it was at home, it was with us all the time. My mother had this element of she, was, she, was, she benefited tremendously from the joys of Jewish life, but she also always was looking over her shoulder a little bit. And there was, which is understandable. And I intellectually related to that, but I never truly, um, uh, yeah, like viscerally, I never felt it. I always thought, I understood why she felt it, but I didn't feel it until October 7th. This is the first time, here I am in my early 50s, this is the first time in my life where I kind of get it. I, I, I feel vulnerable. I just, it, it, you, it, by the way, it's not just me. I, almost every Jew I live, know who lives a public Jewish life feels, feels like they're sort of looking over their shoulder, like my mother did. My children go to a Jewish day school. I see the security around the school that's had to be amped up. I mean, it's, I, you know the stories, it's everywhere. And th this, this is new. I never thought I would feel this and see this. I don't speak nearly as eloquently or with as much credibility around this issue as you, but I have decided that, 
you know, I never, I, I benefited hugely from Jewish culture, but I've never really given back. And I thought, okay, this is my one opportunity to sort of give back. And I've been fairly outspoken. And I'll have you respond to some of the pushback I get, because I think some of the pushback has some value and creates a productive conversation. Some of the pushback I get initially is, Scott, being anti-Israel doesn't make you anti-Semitic. And I'm curious about how you would bifurcate the feelings of people, especially, it, it strikes me, there's just an entirely different viewpoint among young people in America versus people of our generation, of the distinction between being anti-Semitic and anti-Israel. So, I personally have been critical of Israeli government policy at various times over the years. Uh, I probably less so than uh, others I know, but I totally respect even those who are much more critical of Israeli government policy than, than I've been. I think they come at it in good faith, certainly over the last year, incidentally, between January of 2023 and October 7th of 2023. Uh, I was I, I raised a lot of questions and concerns about Israeli domestic government policy as it relates to this judicial reform effort. So I, I think it's completely legitimate to be critical of Israeli government policy as one would be of any government's policies. The, the distinction I draw when someone is critical of Israel is, do you hold Israel to a different standard than you would hold any other country? So one can criticize Israeli government policy like they criticize any government's policy. But with Israel somehow, then it always devolves into a debate about whether or not Israel has a right to exist. It's not just about the policies of the government, it's about the legitimacy of Israeli statehood. And as though Israel's statehood is a manifestation of something illegitimate. And we can get into what those charges all are at some form of you know, colonization or imperialism from the West, or, you know, they, they, they then like project on these other explanations for Israel's existence that should delegitimize it, the right to Israel's existence. But if you, if you criticize Israel, of course that's okay. And that is not anti Semitism. In fact, look at the majority of Israelis. Majority of Israelis are very critical of Israeli give, government policy at any given moment. So let's just put it in the current context. And, I, and, and I'm sure we'll get into this, but, and we, and there's layers and layers and we can get very granular on different issues, but Israel's right to defend itself against a, a genocidal threat that many believed before October 7th was largely rhetorical that was sure it was articulated in the charter of Hamas, that Hamas intended to wipe Israel off the map and slaughter Jews en masse, but there was a sense that they wouldn't actually try to do it. Now we know they're, they wanna do it, right? You know, many friends of mine in the geopolitical uh, analytical world often say when, when bad actors publish repeatedly what they want to do, take them at their word, whether it was what Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf, whether it was that 5,000 word essay that Putin wrote uh, some years ago about what he wanted to do in Ukraine, when they project, when they write what they're going to do, you should pay attention to it. Hamas had written what it wanted to do, and then it tried to do it on October 7th. Now, we can get into a debate about how Israel should respond, but if if you question whether or not Israel has a right to defend itself against this threat in a way that you have you have tolerated and in some cases supported any country to defend itself against comparable threats. Then you are holding Israel to a different standard than you hold any other country. And that therefore is inherently a double standard, which is a form of discrimination. And that's when I think you start to get into questions about, is there a distinction between knee-jerk anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? And I think what we are seeing now is that's not the case. I mean, you look at the absurdity of some of the criticisms of Israel in response to October 7th. It is so utterly, tragically clear that Israel is being held to a standard that these same people who are out protesting are would never hold another country to. I'll put forward a series of theses and you tell me where, where you disagree or agree. I think America has played a vital role in this, and the Biden administration doesn't get enough credit. I think Hamas was looking to do two things. One, inspire global sympathy, 
and attention to their cause, I think they've achieved that, unfortunately. I really do. I think they've tapped into a groundswell of anti-Semitism that we didn't know was there. And two, I thought they were hoping to inspire a multi-front war against Israel, and that has not happened, largely because of two carrier strike forces sitting off the coast that are basically saying, if you do this, we're going to rain violence on you. <laughs> And that is what, unfortunately, geopolitics mostly comes down to. So one, curious about how you feel about the Biden administration's handling of this and um, um, what you think about, uh, uh, let's start there, the Biden administration's approach to this. I, uh, as as you know, my my, uh, general political outlook would not lead me to a place where I praise, uh, look for reasons to praise the Biden administration. And I have been very publicly, uh, supportive of, uh, and, and, and praising of president Biden in his handling of this war. And I, and I want, I want to take a moment on, on this cause I think it's important to your point, Scott, if as Hamas was plotting this and whoever else was helping them from Tehran to Nasrallah and in Lebanon to God knows who else, when they were plotting October 7th, if you would have asked them that, hey, within five days of this massacre, the commander in chief of the most powerful military in the world would not have only given an incredibly, I thought, incredibly moving address, empathizing with the true victims of this massacre the Jewish people in the way that he did that Saturday uh, on October 7th and would have a couple days after that gotten on Air Force One and flown to Israel. The commander in chief of the most powerful army in the world, no president has ever done that. Israel has been in plenty of wars and the U.S. has done a lot to help Israel, whether it was during the first Iraq war when President George H.W. Bush you know, provided Patriot missile technology to shoot down scuds, whether it was uh, Nixon in in 73 with its military airlift that really saved uh, Israel, helped save Israel in a pretty dark period of the Yom Kippur War. You can go back, but a president getting on the plane and going to the war zone, and he didn't just go to the war zone. He, he met with the Israeli war cabinet. He sat there with Netanyahu and Gantz and Aiden, uh, got, uh, Eisenkot and, and, and the, the entire war cabinet as though he was a member of their team. And, and obviously he met with families of the hostages and he, and he did, you know, he did a lot on the ground and then provide, did his provided, we're still waiting for the congressional passage of this, this large $14 billion plus age packet package, but he has still provided a lot of important supplies. And then you mentioned the aircraft carriers and the 2000 Marines in the region and the squadrons. And I mean, I can go on and on and on and on and, and explicitly told Tehran and Hezbollah don't even think for a moment about trying to capitalize on this. I bet it wasn't in Hamas's playbook that that's what the week after October 7th was going to look like. And so I, I repeatedly say <laughs> As far as Israel is concerned, the U.S.-Israel relationship is paramount, and and President Biden deserves a lot of credit. Now, I have some concerns about, I think there's a little bit of good cop, bad cop going on in the administration right now, and certainly you look at some of the things that Vice President Harris said over the last few days that I think are disconcerting, um, these five principles that she articulated, which are, are mostly unrealistic, and I think there's some in the administration, I think the administration is divided, I think there are some in the administration that are concerned about domestic politics and pressure they're getting from their left flank that they need to try to figure out how to mollify uh, with regard to the position President Biden's taken, but by and large, the person who's holding the line on the administration's approach is the president himself. And so it's a long-winded way of saying I, I, I think his support has been extremely important. What are your thoughts about normalization between the kingdom and Israel? So I think that Saudi-Israeli normalization was very far along uh, in uh, on the eve of October 7th, much farther along than, than even many in the press here in the United States that were following it believed. If you look at the UN General Assembly meetings uh, in September in New York, you look at what MBS was saying publicly, you look at what Netanyahu was saying publicly. I you know, and and they it was it was it was moving and it was moving fast. And I think it was going to happen before the end of this year because they wanted to get it done while Biden 
got consumed by the presidential election, which was going to happen next year. And, and the Biden administration was key to getting it done because there were going to be some Senate Democrats in any kind of um, defense pact between the U.S. and Saudi that was key to this. There were going to be some Senate Democrats who were critics of uh, of Saudi that wouldn't want to go along with it, which is why Biden was key. The Biden was going to deliver the Senate Democrats. So I think it was fast moving. Um, October 7th actually is has paused it. Part of the reason Saudi Arabia wanted to integrate or, or normalize with Israel is as one very prominent leader, Saudi leader said to me uh, about four or five years ago, uh, he said, look, we view Israel as the future and we want to partner with the future. And why do we, we, we want to innovate. We want to co-innovate with the leading innovators in the world. Why do we have to get onto, on a 17 hour flight to San Francisco and go to the Bay, Bay area when we want to innovate? We have a Silicon Valley in our backyard. His words, a three hour flight from Riyadh is Tel Aviv. Why, why aren't we just partnering with them on, on food tech, on cybersecurity, on, on, you know, health, healthcare innovations on, I mean, it can go on and on and on. They, you know, they're, they, these, these are some of the areas they were particularly focused on. Why do we have to schlep my word to, um, to the Bay area to do that? So they wanted to integrate with Israel economically and technologically and Undergirding all of this is that Israel and Saudi face a common threat. They have strategic national security, strategic reasons to work together. They have a common threat in Iran, and they have a common threat in extreme Sunni Muslim Arab activism or at worst terrorism. In the case of Saudi Arabia, the threat is for Muslim Brotherhood. In the case of Israel, the threat is Hamas, as we're seeing. So they they had a whole bunch of reasons to partner. Saudi saw in Israel not only a technology superpower and in regionally an economic superpower, but it saw in Israel a security and intelligence juggernaut. And they wanted to piggyback on all of it. The big setback of October 7th is I think the Saudis look at Israel and say, huh, we thought you guys were a security and an intelligence juggernaut. How does a security and intelligence juggernaut completely miss this, miss October 7th? So if anything, the Israel's weakness on October 7th is what is setting back the potential for Saudi Israeli normalization, which is why the Israelis generally believe, and the Israelis and the leadership, I personally believe, this idea that Israel needs to be tempered in its response as a way to get the Saudi-Israeli normalization back on track, I think is completely misguided. If Israel is tempered, Israel will look weak. It will look weak. If a country can unleash the attempted genocide that, that this, what Israel thought and the region thought was a ragtag militia, the way it did on October 7th, it makes Israel look like a paper tiger. And a paper tiger is not what the Saudis are gonna to wanna to do business with. In the 1973 Yom Kippur War, for the first couple of weeks, Israel was completely set back, completely caught off guard and embarrassed. And then Israel bounced back. And when Israel bounced back within a matter of months, it was not only sur surrounding the Egyptian Third Army in the Sinai, but it was staring down at Damascus and Cairo, and they could have taken either one of those cities. They didn't. The point is, it was, it was unequivocal. Israel's ultimate victory in 1973 was unequivocal. You go to U.S. military academies, they don't study the Six-Day War, even though the Six-Day War is the, arguably the more impressive war. They, that the U.S. military academies, they study the 1973 Yom Kippur War because it's a story of bounce back, of resilience, of turning things around and how Israel did it. And what Israel ultimately did in 1973 is they exposed Egypt's military and Syria's military as the paper tigers. And it's not surprising that within less than a decade, Israel had the, a peace treaty with one of those two countries, with Egypt, which at the time was the Saudi Arabia of the region, is because Israel demonstrated strength. And if you fast forward to today, I think the big risk for Israel is the IDF, after what happened on October 7, looks like the paper tiger. And, and, and an IDF that looks like a paper tiger is not one that Saudi's gonna wanna do business with. Israel's contract with its own people was broken on October 7th because of that security collapse, and it has to repair that. But it also has to do it to repair its geopolitical position. And I think if it demonstrates that it has wiped out this Hamas threat, and it has restored security, and that October 7th was bad, it was a setback, but in the scheme of history, it will be viewed as a hiccup, I think we could have Saudi-Israeli normalization within a year.
So just along the lines of being optimistic about, a, a, you know, how we move forward and hopefully develop something resembling a sustainable peace in the U.S. One, it feels to me in hindsight, Obama's decision to withdraw from the Middle East was uh, a mistake. That without, without whatever you want to call us, the world's policemen, it, it, there was a vacuum that was filled by people who weren't, didn't represent Western interests. I don't think there's ever going to be a sustainable peace with Hamas in power, which I'm sure you agree with. What you probably disagree with is I don't think there's a sustainable peace as long as Netanyahu's in office. And that is, um, I just think the disassembly of the, of the, of the courts, the way they have approached, I, I, quite frankly, Dan, I think his approach to Hamas is, or not Hamas, his approach to Gaza has been diabolical. I mean, actually supporting Hamas in an attempt to divide the country further, um, that the only sustainable peace is going to be, uh, obviously you can't have a terrorist organization representing a government whose only amendment is the extermination of a, of a race of people. But I also don't think it's sustainable as long as we have kind of this far right government in Israel. And I'm curious what your thoughts are there. I have known Netanyahu for a long time. I, um, I have been supportive of many things he's done. Uh, over his many decades of of public service, uh, I have been deeply concerned before October seventh uh, about uh, some of the way his government has has tackled certain issues. You mentioned judicial reform, which is one of them, but not the only one. Uh, since he returned to power in twenty twenty three, I I think the Israelis are ruthless about accountability and scrutiny when there are security setbacks, ruthless. I mean, the United States could learn something from this. If you look at what happened after the Yom Kippur War, even though Israel ultimately was successful and won the war, it ended Golda Meir's career. There was a commission of inquiry and set back the Labor Party, really, for a generation politically. You look at the 2006 Second Lebanon War, ended Ehud Omer's uh, political life. Uh, I think that the idea, there will be a commission of inquiry after this war. And the idea that Netanyahu's going to be let off the hook. I just don't buy it. He was he was he was prime minister when it happened. Now, in fairness, he wasn't the only prime minister since Israel disengaged from Gaza. Israel left Gaza in 2005. Since Israel left from Gaza, there was Prime Minister Sharon, there was Prime Minister Omer, there was Prime Minister Bennett, there was Prime Minister Lapid, and then there was Prime Minister Netanyahu. So there were many prime ministers who were all familiar with Israel's policy. He but he he more than anyone shaped the policy. I think just look at the politics of the country right now where public opinion is. There's no way any prime minister can politically survive something like this. This is catastrophic. As I said, it's worse than the Yom Kippur War. I can't think of another setback Israel has faced that is as bad as this. And it not only happened on his watch, but he was Mr. Security. The whole, his whole political brand was, you may not yeah, like me. You may me. not like me, but I'll keep you safe. Yeah. Right. Well, so much for that. And so, And so I just think this question can he can he be the one i just don't i just don't think he will be the one we'll be right back so let's let's move to your book the thing that struck me in your book and i love this line you said the united states has strong institutions but a weak society and israel has a very strong society but weak institutions say more look in the in the united states and and you've you've written extensively about this uh and i know your audience is is very familiar with it but i i, uh, I want to just spend a moment on it to establish the contrast israeli uh, american society is broken we have record levels of loneliness we have uh, a demographic crisis brewing people aren't having children anymore or at least not at the rates they were which means our population like many con populations around the world are going to are aging and shrinking. These are aging and most Western affluent democracies are aging and shrinking. Now, Japan is at the pointy end of the spear. I was in Japan last April and I was meeting with some government officials who point to the fact that its population is shrinking as the biggest threat to the country, not China, not China. The biggest threat to Japan is they're an aging and shrinking country and aging and shrinking countries become economically busted because the younger, there aren't enough young people to support older people and they become less innovative. You have a loneliness epidemic you have a you have a mental health crisis. You have a teen mental health crisis, and I know you've written a lot about it. And the 
phrase I never in a million years thought I would see. And I'm the father of two teenage boys, as I know you are. Uh, the CDC comes out with this report a few months ago. There is a teen suicide crisis, just that term, a teen, su like th th that's a thing, you know, the record staggering levels of teens attempting suicide or committing suicide. And I can go on and on and on with, with how, you know, uh, uh, longevity, um, deaths, deaths of despair, um, from drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and suicide at record levels. So Israel, on every one of these metrics, and this is what we lay out in the book, every one of these metrics is in, is is not just doing a little better, it's in an opposite direction. Israel's population, its fertility rate is way above the replacement level. Israelis are having lots and lots of children. It's not just the ultra-Orthodox families, it's secular, hyper-secular Israelis working in tech in the coolest, hippest parts of very hedonistic Tel Aviv are having three, four, and five children. Israelis are living longer than Europeans, Americans. There's no loneliness crisis. There's no teen mental health crisis. Uh, there's a sense of happiness and optimism. Even during low points, Israel ranks the fourth happiest country in the world. And when I raise this, friends of mine who write about this issue, with the, the, when they point the, to the brokenness of American society, they point to things like, well, what do you expect from from why people are living with such despair in the United States. They're, all they're hearing about is is climate change catastrophe. Young people are only hearing about school shootings. There's political polarization is off the charts. And, uh, and you know, they, they go on and on and on and on. And I, and I point out Israel has every one of those things. Oh, by the way, and they're spending all their time scrolling on their phones. So it is true. Americans are exposed to a lot of information about climate catastrophe. So are Israelis. You want to talk about gun violence? I mean, young Israelis, almost every one of them at age 18, go to serve in the military and they know what it's like to have their lives on the lines or to lose friends and to lose loved ones. They, they really know what violence in their daily life is about. Political polarization in Israel at times is off the charts, especially in 2023, where you had hundreds of thousands of people storming the streets every Saturday night to protest. And Israeli kids have as much access to smartphones as anyone else. So why? Like Israel has all these dynamics. It has weak institutions, as we saw in the judicial reform debate in 2023, as we saw in Israel's immediate response to October 7th, weak institutions, weak, weak government institutions. But the society is thriving. People feel connected to each other. They feel connected to the country. They feel connected to community. They feel connected to, to um, their families. And so how does that manifest itself? One, and I'm just going to give a couple examples. In the book, we go through a whole bunch. You can't underestimate the role of national service. So the fact that a majority of Israelis at their formative years in their lives, 18, 19, 20, 21, don't go to college. They don't, and they don't spend the years leading up to that trying to get into the best college. The sorting system in the United States is, is the college application process, which is all about everything about the college application process is me, I, my performance, individual excellence. How did I do? What are my grades? What are my SAT tests? What kind of reference letters can I persuade someone? How to am I better about? than the person on my left and right? Right. Yeah. Where in Israel, if you want to serve, when you, everyone, most people serve in the military, the goal is to get into the best units possible. It doesn't matter how talented you are. No matter, it doesn't matter what kind of individual excellence you have. If you can't work with other people, if you can't serve as part of a team effectively, if you don't understand what it means to be part of a group, if you don't have a communal mindset, you won't get admitted to those best units. And so the whole incentive system as kids are getting older, beginning with youth movements when they're young, the army when they're 18, all the incentives are about how do I perform with other people, not just me? And I will be rewarded based on how I work with other people. It changes the whole culture of the country. Um, and, you know, uh, we write in the book about the role of Shabbat, of Friday nights, of the Sabbath. We, we call it Thanksgiving every week. Now, some Jews observe it more religiously and traditionally than others. But the point is the overwhelming majority of Israelis shut down every Friday night to be with family, friends, two generations, three generations, sometimes four generations. And there's a sense that they are, they are sharing in that experience with the people they love and they're sharing, the, and the whole country is sharing that experience. 
Dan Senor is a best-selling author, the host of the Call Me Back podcast, and a co-founder of the Board of Directors of the Foreign Policy Initiative. He also serves as a partner at Elliott Management. Previously, Dan served as a senior advisor to former Speaker Paul Ryan's campaign for vice president and foreign policy advisor to Senator Mitt Romney's presidential campaigns. His new book, The Genius of Israel, The Surprising Resilience of a Divided Nation in a Turbulent World, is out now. He joins us from his home in Manhattan. Dan, I remember... <laughs> I took Ashley, my younger sister we referenced before, to Washington, D.C., on a tour of D.C., hoping that it would inspire her. And the good news was it, it did. The bad news is she immediately became an intern in some crazy right-wing Republicans' <laughs> uh, office. And me as a, you know, a deep blue progressive. And then I met you, and you were another Republican. I'm like, oh, my God, I failed. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I, I was immediately yeah, like— you're coming at me from all directions. Like, this didn't this didn't pan out the way it had hoped, and now I look back on that fondly because uh, I, I just think you've grown into such an impressive man, and I really also just want to say I appreciate uh, the resilience and the courage you're showing around this issue. Anyways, Dan, I'm I'm just thrilled to reconnect with you, and congratulations on the life and the success you've built. Thank you, Scott. Obviously, that uh, means a lot to me. I do remember. <laughs> <laughs> your visits. And I will say, as much as you felt that your sister was getting uh, uh, enveloped by crazy right-wing Republicans, we will look back with... They uh, say the, moderate. Uh, yeah, quaint. <laughs> they, that was a quaint they time. Seemed, that yes. was, the Cheneys seem reasonable. Yeah, yeah we're going to romanticize the Gingrich era of the 1990s. 100%. That's the reason ones. All right, brother. Stay safe. Thanks. Thank you.